the beetle horde. Chapter 10. At Bay. Bram put his fingers to his mouth and whistled, a shrill whistle, yet audible to Dodd, Tommy, and Hadia. Instantly, three pairs of beetles appeared out of the throng. Their tentacles went out, and the two men and the girl found themselves hoisted separately upon the backs of the pairs. Next moment, they were flying side by side, high in the air above the surrounding swarm. They could see one another, but it was impossible for them to make their voices heard above the rasping of the beetle legs. Hours went by, while the moon crossed the sky and dipped toward the horizon. Tommy knew that the moon would set about the hour of dawn, and the stars were already beginning to pale when he saw a line of telegraph poles, then two lines of shining metals, then a small settlement of stone and brick houses. Tommy was not familiar with the geography of Australia, but he knew this must be the transcontinental line. Whirling onward, the cloud of beetles suddenly swooped downward. For a moment, Tommy could see the frightened occupants of the settlement crowding into the single street. Then he shuddered with sick horror as he saw them obliterated by the swarm. There was no struggle no attempt at flight or resistance. One moment those forty-odd men were there, the next minute they existed no longer. There was nothing but a swarm of beetles, walking about like men with shells upon their backs. And now Tommy saw evidences of Bram's devilish control of the swarm, for out of the cloud dropped what seemed to be a phalanx of beetle guards, the military police of beetledom and, lashing fiercely with their tentacles, they drove back all the swarm that sought to join their companions in their ghoulish feast. There was just so much food and no more. The rest must seek theirs further. But even beetles, it may be presumed, are not entirely under discipline at all times. The pair of beetles that bore Tommy suddenly swooped apart, ten or a dozen feet from the ground, and dashed into the thick of the struggling, frenzied mass, flinging their rider to the earth. Tommy struck the soft sand, sat up half-dazed, saw his shell lying a few feet away from him, and retrieved it just as a couple of monsters came swooping down at him. He looked about him. Not far away stood Dodd and Hadia, with their shells on their backs. They recognized Tommy and ran toward him. Not more than twenty yards away stood the railroad station, with several crates of goods on the platform. Next to it was a substantial house of stone with the front door open. Tommy pointed to it, and Dodd understood and shouted something that was lost in the furious buzz of the beetle's wings as they devoured their prey. The three raced for the entrance gained it unmolested, and closed the door. There was a key in the door, and it was light enough for them to see a chain, which Dodd pulled into position. There was only one story. There were three rooms, apparently with the kitchen. Tommy rushed to the kitchen door, locked it too, and with almost superhuman efforts dragged the large iron stove against it. He rushed to the window, but it was a mere loophole, not large enough to admit a child. Nevertheless, he stood the heavy table on end so that it covered it. Then he ran back. Dodd had already barricaded the window of the larger room, which was a bed-sitting room, with heavy wardrobe and the wooden bedstead jamming the two pieces sideways against the wall so that they could not be forced apart without being demolished. He was now busy in the smaller room, which seemed to be the station master's office, dragging an iron safe across the floor. But the window was crisscrossed with iron bars, and it was evident that the safe, which was locked, contained at times considerable money, for the window could hardly have been forced save by a charge of nitroglycerin or dynamite. However, it was against the door that Dodd placed the safe, and he stood back, panting. Good, said Hadia. That will hold them. 
The two men looked at her doubtfully. Did Hadia know what she was talking about? The sun had risen. A long shaft shot into the room. Outside the beetles were still buzzing as they turned over the vestiges of their prey. There were as yet no signs of attack. Suddenly Tommy grasped Dodd's arm. Look, he shouted, pointing to a corner which had been in gloom a moment before. There was a table there, and on it a telegraphic instrument. Telegraphy had been one of Tommy's hobbies in boyhood. In a moment he was busy at the table. Dot, dash, dot, dash. Then suddenly outside a furious hum and the impact of beetle bodies against the front door. Tommy got up, grinning. That was the first interrupted message from Tommy that was received. Through the barred window the three could see the furious efforts of the beetles to force an entrance, but the very tensile strength of the beetle shells, which rendered them impervious to bullets, required a laminate construction which rendered them powerless against brick or stone. Desperately the swarm dashed itself against the walls, until the ground outside was piled high with stunned beetles. Not the faintest impression was made on the defenses. "'Watch them, Jim,' said Tom. "'I'll go see if the rear's secure.' That thought of his seemed to have been anticipated by the beetles, for as Tommy reached the kitchen the swarm came dashing against the door and window, always recoiling. Tommy came back, grinning all over his face. You were right, Hadia, he said. We've held them all right, and the tables are turned on Bram. Also, I got a message through, I think, he added to Dodd. Dash, dot, dash, dot from the instrument. Tommy ran to the table again. Dash, dot, went back. For five minutes Tommy labored while the beetles hammered now on one door, now on another, now on the windows. Then Tommy got up. It was some station down the line, he said. I've told them, and they're sending a man up here to replace the telegraphist, also a couple of cops. They think I'm crazy. I told them again. That's the best I could do. Dodd, Travers, for the last time, let's talk. The cloud of beetles seemed to have thinned, for the sun was shining into the room. Bram's voice was perfectly audible. Though he himself was invisible, probably he thought it likely that the defenders had obtained firearms. "'Nothing to say to you, Bram,' called Dodd. "'We've finished our discussion on the monotremes.' "'I want you fellows to stand in with me,' came Bram's plaintive tones. "'It's so lonesome all by oneself, Dodd.' Ah. You're beginning to find that out, are you? Dodd could not resist answering. You'll be lonelier yet before you're through. Dodd, I didn't bring the swarm up here, I swear it. I've been trying to control them from the beginning. I saw what was coming. I believe I can avert this horror, drive them into the sea or something like that. Don't make me desperate, Dodd. And listen, old man, about those monotremes. Sensible men don't quarrel over things like that. Why can't we agree to differ? Ah, now you're talking, Bram, Dodd answered. Only you're too late. After what's happened here today, we'll have no truck with you. That's final. Damn you, shrieked Bram. I'll batter down this house. I'll... You'll do nothing, Bram, because you can't. Dodd answered. Travers has wired full information about your devil horde, and likewise about you, and all Australia will be prepared to give you a warm reception when you arrive. I tell you I'm invincible, Bram screamed. In three days Australia will be in ruin, a depopulated desert. In a week all southern Asia. In three weeks Europe. In two months America. You've been taking too many of those pellets, Bram, Dodd answered. Stand back now, stand back, wherever you are, or I'll open the door and throw the slops all over you. 
Bram's screech rose high above the droning of the wings. In another moment the interior of the room had grown as black as night. The rattle of the beetle shells against the four walls of the house was like the clattering of stage thunder. All through the darkness Dodd could hear the unhurried clicking of the key. At last the rattling ceased. The sun shone in again. The ground all around the house was packed with fallen beetles, six feet high, a writhing mass that creaked and clattered as it strove to disengage itself. Bram's voice once more. I'm leaving a guard, Dodd. They'll get you if you try to leave. But they won't eat you. I'm going to have you three sliced into little pieces. The thousand deaths of the Chinese. The beetles will eat the parts that are sliced away, and you'll live to watch them. I'll be back with a stick or two of dynamite tomorrow. Yeah, but listen, Bram, Dodd sang out. Listen, you old marsupial tiger. When those pipe dreams clear away, I'm going to build a gallows of beetle shells reaching to the moon to hang you on. Bram's screech of madness died away. The strident rasping of the beetle's legs began again. For hours the three heard it. It was not until nightfall that it died away. Bram made good his threat, for all around the house, extending as far as they could see, was the host of beetle guards. To venture out, even with their shells about them, was clearly a hazardous undertaking. There was neither food nor water in the place. We'll just have to hold out, said Dodd, breaking one of the long periods of silence. Tommy did not answer. He did not hear him, for he was busy at the key. Suddenly he leaped to his feet. God, Jimmy, he cried. That devil's making good his threat. The swarms in South Australia, destroying every living thing, wiping out whole towns and villages. And they, they believe me now. He sank into a chair. For the first time, the strain of the awful past seemed to grip him. Hadia came to his side. The beetles are finished, she said in her soft voice. How do you know, Hadia? demanded Dodd. The beetles are finished. Hadia repeated quietly. That was all that Dodd could get out of her. But again the key began to click, and Tommy staggered to the table. Dot, dash, dash, dot. Presently he looked up once more. The swarm's halfway to Adelaide, he said. They want to know if I can help them. Help them? he burst into hysterical laughter. Toward evening he came back after an hour at the key. Line must be broken, he said. I'm getting nothing. In the moonlight they could see the huge compound eyes of the beetle guards glittering like enormous diamonds outside. They had not been conscious of thirst during the day, but now, with the coming of the cool night, their desire for water became paramount. Tommy, there must be water in the station, said Dodd. I'm going to get a pitcher from the kitchen and risk it, Tommy. Take care of Hadia if, he added. But Hadia laid her hand upon his arm. Do not go, Jimmy Dodd, she said. We can be thirsty tonight, and tomorrow the beetles will be finished. How do you know? asked Dodd again. But now he realized that Hadia had never learned the significance of an interrogation. She only repeated her statement, and again the two men had to remain content. The long night passed, outside the many facets of the beetle's eyes. Inside the two men, desperate with anxiety, not for themselves, but for the fate of the world, snatching a few moments' sleep from time to time, then looking up to see those glaring eyes from the silent watchers. Then dawn came, stealing over the desert, and the two shook themselves free from sleep, and now the eyes were gone. But there was immense activity among the beetles. They were scurrying to and fro, and as they watched, Dodd and Tommy began to see some significance in their movements. Why, they're digging trenches, Tommy shouted. That's horrible, Jimmy. 
Are they intending to conduct sapping operations against us like engineers, or what? Dodd did not reply, and Tommy hardly expected any answer. As the two men, now joined by Hadia, watched, they saw that the beetles were actually digging themselves into the sand. Within the space of an hour, by the time the first shafts of sunlight began to stream into the room, there was to be seen only the massive, rounded shells of the monsters as they squatted in the sand. "'Now you may fetch water,' said Hadia, smiling at her lover. "'No, no, do not need shells,' she added. "'The beetles are finished. It is as the wise men of my people told me.' Wandering, hesitating, Tommy and Dodd unlocked the front door. They stood upon the threshold ready to bolt back again, but there was no stirring among the beetle hosts. Growing bolder, they advanced a few steps. Then, shamed by Hadia's courage, they followed her, still cautiously, to the station. Dodd shouted as he saw a water tank and a receptacle above with a watercock. They let Hedia drink, then followed suit, and for a few moments, as they appeased their thirst, the beetles were forgotten. Then they turned back. There had been no movement in that line of shells that glinted in the morning sunlight. Come. I shall show you, said Hadia confidently, advancing toward the trench. Dodd would have stopped her, but the girl moved forward quickly, eluded him with a graceful, mirthful gesture, and stooped down over the trench. She rose up, raising in her arms an empty beetle shell. Dodd, who had reached the trench before Tommy, turned round and yelled to him excitedly. Tommy ran forward, and then he understood. The shells were empty. The swarm, whose life cycle Bram had admitted he did not understand, had just molted. It had molted because the bodies, gorged with food, had grown too large for the shells. In time, if left alone, the monsters would grow larger shells, become invincible again. But just now they were defenseless as newborn babes, and knew it. Deep underneath the empty shells they had burrowed into the ground, everywhere at the bottom of deep trenches were the naked, bestial creatures, waving helpless tentacles and squirming over one another as they strove to find shelter and security. A sudden madness came over Tommy and Dodd. Dynamite! There must be dynamite, Dodd shouted as he ran back to the station. Something better than dynamite, shouted Tommy, holding up one of a score of drums of petrol. Chapter 11 The World Set Free They waited two days at Settler's Station. To push along the line into the desert would have been useless, and both men were convinced that an airplane would arrive for them, but it was not until the second afternoon that the aviator arrived, half-dead with thirst and fatigue, and almost incoherent. He was the last plane on the Australian continent. He brought the news of the destruction of Adelaide and of the siege of Melbourne and Sydney, as he termed it. He told Dodd and Tommy that the two cities had been surrounded with trenches and barbed wire. Machine guns and artillery were bombarding the trenches in which the beetles had taken shelter. Has anyone been out on reconnaissance? asked Tommy. Nobody had been permitted to pass through the barbed wire, though there had been volunteers. It meant certain death. But unless the beetles were sapping deep in the ground, what their purpose was, nobody knew. Tommy and Dodd led him to the piles of smoking, stinking debris and told him. That was where the aviator fainted from sheer relief. The Commonwealth wants you to take supreme command against the beetles, he told Tommy, when he had recovered. I'm to bring you back. Not that they expect me back, but, God, what a piece of news. Forgive my swearing. I, I used to be a parson. Still am, for that matter of fact. How are you going to bring us three back in your plane? asked Tommy. I shall stay here with Jimmy Dodd, said Hadia suavely. 
There is not the least danger any more. You must destroy the beetles before their shells have grown again. That's all. Used to be a parson, you say? Still are? shouted Dodd excitedly. Thank God! I mean, I'm glad to hear it. Come inside, and, and come quick. I want you too, Tommy. Then Tommy understood, and it seemed as if Hadia understood, by some instinct that belongs exclusively to women, for her cheeks were flushed as she turned and smiled into Dodd's eyes. Ten minutes later, Tommy hopped into the biplane, leaving the happy married couple at Settler Station. His eyes grew misty as the plane took the air, and he saw them waving to him from the ground. Dodd and Hadia and he had been through so many adventures and had reached safety. He must not fail. He did not fail. He found himself at Sydney in command of thirty thousand men, all enthusiastic for the fight for the human race, soldiers and volunteers ready to fight until they dropped. When the news of the situation was made public, an immense wave of hope ran through the world. National differences were forgotten. Color and creed and race grew more tolerant of one another. A new day had dawned, the day of humanity's true liberation. Tommy's first act was to call out the fire companies and have the beetles' trenches saturated with petrol from the fire hoses. Then incendiary bullets, shot from guns from a safe distance, quickly converted them into blazing infernos. But even so, only a tithe of the beetle army had been destroyed. Two hundred planes had already been rushed from New Zealand, and their aviators went up and scoured the country far and wide. Everywhere they found trenches, and where the soil was stony, millions of the beetles clustered helplessly beneath great mounds of discarded shells. An army of black trackers had been brought in planes from all parts of the country, and they searched out the beetle masses everywhere along the course that the invaders had taken. Then incendiary bombs were dropped from above. Day after day the beetle massacre went on. By the end of a week the survivors of the invasion began to take heart again. It was certain that the greater portion of the horde had been destroyed. There was only one thing lacking. No trace of Bram had been seen since his appearance at the head of his beetle army in front of Broken Hill, and louder and more insistent grew the world clamor that he should be found and put to death in some way more horrible than any yet devised. The ingenuity of a million minds worked upon this problem. Newspapers all over the world offered prizes for the most suitable form of death. Ingenious oriental tortures were rediscovered. The only thing lacking was Bram. A spy craze ran through Australia. Five hundred Brams were found, and all of them were in imminent danger of death before they were able to prove an alias. And, oddly enough, it was Tommy and Dodd who found Bram, for Dodd had been brought back east, together with his bride, and given an important command in the army of the extermination. Dodd had joined Tommy not far from Broken Hill, where a swarm of a hundred thousand beetles had been found in a little-known valley. The monsters had begun to grow new shells, and the news had excited a fresh wave of apprehension. The airplanes had concentrated for an attack upon them, and Tommy and Dodd were riding together, Tommy at the controls and Dodd observing. Dodd called through the tube to Tommy and indicated a mass that was moving through the scrub, some fifty thousand beetles, executing short hops and evidently regaining some vitality. Tommy nodded. He signaled, and the fleet of planes circled around and began to drop their incendiary bombs. Within a few minutes the beetles were ringed with a wall of fire. Presently the whole terrain was a blazing furnace. Hours later, when the fires had died away, Tommy and Dodd went down to look at the destruction that had been wrought. The scene was horrible. Great masses of charred flesh, 
and shell were piled up everywhere. "'I guess that's been a pretty thorough job,' said Tommy. "'Let's get back, Jim.' "'What's that?' cried Dodd, pointing. Then, "'My God, Tommy! It's one of our men!' It was a man, but it was not one of their men, that creeping, maimed, half-cinder and half-human thing that was trying to crawl into the hollow of a rock. It was Bram, and recognition was mutual. Bram dropping, moaning. He was only the shell of a man, and it was incredible how he had managed to survive that ordeal of fire, the remainder of his life, which only his indomitable will had held in that shattered body, was evidently a matter of minutes. But he looked up at Dodd and laughed. So, you're here, damn you, he snarled, and you think you've won. I've another card, another invasion of the world. Beside which this is child's play. It's an invasion. Bram was going, but he pulled himself together with a supreme effort. Invasion by new species of monotremes, he croaked. Deep down in earth was saving to prove you a liar you are. Monotremes! egg-laying platypus big as an elephant, existent long before Pleistocene epic. Make you recant, you lying fool. Bram died, an outburst of bitter laughter on his lips. Dodd stood silent for a while, then, reverently, he removed his hat. He was a madman and a devil, but he had the potentialities of a god, Tommy, he said. 